and I'm an assistant professor at Columbia GSAC, where I direct the natural materials lab and also the building technology curriculum. And um, my main expertise is in natural, raw, non-treated, non-calculated, non-heated building materials, their life cycles, production systems, policy, and specifically the use of earth and vegetable fibers and construction in the buildings. There is a momentum now, for sure, in the past decade or so, for bringing back these materials and trying to, of course, given the environmental and social urgencies, devise strategies to re-implement these materials in mainstream construction. Earth materials um, that are not calcinated or stabilized or heated can last almost forever while being maintained. So as long as they are maintained, they last. And once we don't maintain them, once we are maybe, you know, not in need anymore for a shelter, or not um, occupying shelters um, on the planet anymore, then these materials can go back as a soil nutrition, as a nutrition to the land. So I think that what geo materials teach us is that there is no homogeneity, really. There is a heterogeneity, there is a variance, there is a material variability that is inherent in natural materials, but actually in all materials around us. And this striving to have something that is sterile, that is homogeneous, is just, you know, a bug we have in the system, um, uh, um, a perfectionist impossibility. So that is what earth materials continuously teach me is how materials can be disobedient, how they can be porous, how they can be reacting differently in different constituency in different mixed designs. The main method for deriving this question or this notion is by using these materials with our bare hands. So there's a law in my lab. The only law is that we do not use materials we don't want to mix with our bare hands. So even lime um, as a binder, which is considered a natural, relatively low carbon binder, is not something we tend to use just because it's um, sometimes can be um, um, nasty on our hands. Um, so that will be the main focus, working with the material, with our hands, with our bodies, and using the material, um, specifically in the natural materials lab, we're looking at three streams of making or creating with geo biomaterials. One is by digital fabrication or 3D printing, so working with machine to create some little accuracy. The second is, um, mechanical compression, so whether into bricks or tiles or forms, um, earth and geo biomaterials are materials that like to be pressed. And the third stream is manual craft, so weaving, creating textiles, and really sculpting the material. One thing that we're going to, going to do um, this spring in Paris, I'm going to engage our, uh, three layers of um, the local soils combined with fibers, with different um, um, pigments to then create a map or a pattern that reflects on the nature of. So it's going to be a site-specific installation in the Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris. So we are looking at different modes of traditional techniques. My um, not related to my maybe scholarship, but I use soil a lot, uh, making smaller scale artifacts. It's a way for me to maybe contemplate with the material, to um, uh, understand how different mixtures can add and apply for their sculptural abilities. But aside from that, everything that we do is essentially not new. Maybe the 3D printed or digital fabrication stuff, but that as well can be seen in different ways of either pottery, 
practices or earth bag or earth layering practices in Iran, for instance. So you can trace back how these modes of assembly um, have been used, maybe not by machinery, um, but in, there are these interesting references to how um, these materials were used in the past. So it's such a valuable material, it right, ranges from one edge of one side of the construction site to another side of the construction site. So soil by itself is inherently variable, different, changing, um, non-consistent. Um, and you know, sometimes I'll work with soil and it will not work. And I'll try and try and try and add and change and more, uh, more plasticized with water, less plasticized with water, more fiber, less fiber. And then someone will come to me with, look at this amazing mud we found for you, Lola, because everyone knows now that if they find nice mud, they need to let me know. And suddenly it will work. The printing will work. The, the sculpture piece will, will be, um, it will be easier to work with it because it's, it's the right type of soil. So I keep reminding myself that if something is not working for me, I need to go back, test the amount of clay in the soil. Maybe different clays will also react or behave differently. So if it's a kaolin-based clay-rich soil, it will behave differently from a bentonite-rich clay-rich soil. Um, it's um, really the type of clay and the particle size distribution. So a very silky soil will be very, very greasy. With time, I developed the felt sense of differentiating between clay soil and clay silky loam or soil. So that I, I learned that the silk will not be sticky, but it will be greasy, if that makes sense. Um, similar to that, sometimes when I have too much clay in my soil, I make sand. So I learned different techniques to listen to the sand. So I'll take the sand and I'll crunch it near my ear to listen to it. And if it's crunchy enough, I know that it's jagged and I will know that it will have enough um, surface area to capture the clay in the soil and the mixture between that sand and the clay rich soil will be great. If you're a chef and you're developing a recipe for a cookie, right, you want to create the most high performance cookie, then you look at the ingredients, right? The egg will be the binder, the flour might be the aggregate, the, um, the baking powder will, you know, be the bioadditive that makes the chemical reaction. Very similar to that is how we treat building materials and how we should start looking at building materials that are um, not only be engaging, but can also be healthy, food grade um, building materials. So similar to what we eat or what we consume affects our body and affects our health. Very similar to that, the buildings that surround us or the um, uh, finishes mostly that surround us in the built environment affect our health through either inhalation or um, thermal exchange to ingestion. We are continuously in exchange with our built environment. So we might as well think about building materials that we are feeling or we, we can consume or in uh, secondary consumption or um, non-direct consumption um, and also building materials that just for, for our a substance add to our biome. So two things we should do with new materials, whether they are made of earth, fibers, or other next-gen non-conventional materials, bacterial materials, um, fungi-based, is we need to um, check their thermal or characterize their thermal possibilities in different climates. And we need to understand their microstructure and for these two kind of aspirations, um, I feel that the Historic Preservation Lab has been really influential and important. This is, for instance, a thermal camera we, we used for um, looking or testing or evaluating the thermal capacity or storage of earth materials, specifically earth 
chases or, or chairs or sitting modalities um, and their ability to store heat that is pumped from heat veins or um, uh, heat wires uh, that can then be transferred in a conductive way immediately to the user. And you can see in the images that, um, that we uh, created a, a chase made from a bamboo skeleton, um, light straw clay tissue, a clay plaster, um, and those heat things that um, um, pump the heat into the chase. And you can see in the thermal camera images how the heat is then transferred to the user, to the model, who, by the way, mentioned that it was like sitting on a piece of land that was warmed by the sun. I always recommend my students to go to workshops, to go to hands-on workshops by, and there's, like, if you Google, call, Play plaster, round earth, workshop. You'll find these kind of engagements all around the world, Nor northeast US to you know Thailand. Um, so really, going to workshop is a really, really great technique um, to learn more about the materials and what does that mean. I would recommend your students to really um, not shy away from using new materials ditch the foam, <laughs> ditch the, um, the uh, uh, rockite, <laughs> and use um, materials that can be found in their immediate nature uh, or in the backyards if they are, you know, not in the middle of New York City, um, and really use these materialities to examine their strength, their durability, their workability, um, and develop their own kind of mixtures or recipes for using a range of geo, fiber, um, additive materials. So from using subsoil, some shredded um, uh, dry uh, tomato stalks and um, uh, aloe vera juice, you can create such a, an amazing material that aloe vera will act as the bio binder, as the biopolymer. Everything that is gooey is a great binder. The fiber, the dry fibers will act as a reinforcement and the clay in the subsoil will create this kind of homogeneity of, um, not homogeneity, but maybe the binding of that um, mixed design. So um, really learning what we have in our immediate nature and how we can use it is something I would recommend every um, to, to um, investigate.